Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. I hope you watched my last video, uh, an introduction to the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary, um, because that lays the groundwork so that you can really understand um, exactly what took place in the early years of church history. So please watch that, it's, it's uh, really essential in order to understand the whole thing. But right now I, I'm going to begin the verse by verse commentary on the book of Galatians. And so let's start now with Galatians chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Well, um, of course, so there should be no question, there's no dispute as to the author of this, uh, this epistle. I, I always have to keep in mind that, that some people who may watch my videos are um, novice and some of you are very advanced in your Bible studies. But for those, those who are novices, I, I, I don't want to just assume that you understand some basic things. When I say it's an epistle, um, an epistle is just a letter uh, that was written um, by, in this case, by the Apostle Paul. It was written to the church uh, that he established in uh, uh, Galatia. Um, there are many epistles uh, in the New Testament. Uh, the first epistle um, really is the, uh, the book of Acts. And that's something that is, uh, I think, really uh, almost universally overlooked. The book of Acts is actually an epistle. If you read the, the first chapter, you'll see that uh, um, Luke, is writing a letter uh, to someone, I, I forgot his name, but it identifies that he's writing this letter to this person in order to uh, give him uh, a, a historical account of all of these events and assure him that these are not just fables, that, they're, that, that Luke is an eyewitness and he spent a lot of time studying and researching and confirming that these are all true and, and uh, he would, was going to provide him with many infallible proofs. So the first epistle is the book of Acts. And then after the book of Acts, uh, uh, you've got uh, Romans through Philemon that are all epistles. Uh, and, and then uh, even um, the book of Hebrews, uh, I, I guess that would have to be considered an epistle too, even though it's not uh, uh, really addressed to a particular church congregation. It, the title alone tells us it's written to Hebrew people and specifically Hebrew believers. Um, so these are, are letters. Um, uh, rather than um, the gospel accounts, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, these are written as... Um, uh, more of a, an essay, uh, but not a letter to a particular church or to a particular individual. <clears throat> so that's what an epistle is, a letter. Um, Paul, an apostle. So Paul is stating here, I am an apostle. And to be an apostle, uh, particularly at that time, I, I, I would say that that is a, the, the highest um, position, the highest um, uh, title that, that would, um, would be given as, as an honor 
to the to the named person. Um, we know that there were twelve apostles um, that Jesus selected. Um, we know that after Judas uh, died, the remaining apostles, I believe, they took it upon themselves uh, to use a uh, drawing of lots to choose a replacement, and uh, they they ended up uh, choosing uh, Matthias, and there's nothing ever mentioned about Matthias in the entire remainder of, of the scriptures. Uh, so perhaps they they took uh, liberty to try to choose a replacement and that it was not really their job. Uh, maybe God did not direct them to do it. They just took it upon themselves. That's how I see it. Uh, because many people believe that the Apostle Paul uh, I, is the is the apostle that would be the replacement for um, for Jude, uh, Judas. Uh, but there is a dispute in the beginning of the church, and even the book of Galatians, much of this is really um, uh, to uh, address the, the charge uh, that against Paul that he's not really an apostle. He's a false teacher. That's what uh, the Judaizers, the um, the false teachers, who are trying to spoil uh, all of the Apostle Paul's work, ruin his churches, turn them into uh, uh, works, lordship, uh, Judaism, uh, Christian uh, uh, aberrations, rather than uh, what Paul established. And that was that uh, um, Christianity and Christians are simply people who believe entirely on Christ. That's why we're called Christians. We, we rely completely on Christ for our salvation. And that's as simply as I know how to state it. And that's really what Paul's message was, that... Uh, um, you must have faith in nothing else apart from Jesus Christ uh, and, and the person and finished work of Jesus Christ and his pro faith in his promise that you received eternal life as a free gift. Uh, so um, he, he claims that he's an apostle and we find out in the epistles that there are other people that are arguing against that. And this is a, this is something that even persists to this very day. On YouTube, we're, we find a lot of people, and when I say a lot, I, I'm basically I'm surprising to me how many people uh, dismiss Paul a, a, as a false apostle. Um, these, all the people who want to uh, um, reject uh, the, the gospel, the good news that salvation is a free gift. No religious work is required by us. Only the work that Jesus did on our behalf. He suffered and died for our sins. That was the work that was required and Jesus did it for us. So um, those people who reject that and believe that uh, faith alone in Christ alone is insufficient, uh, these people uh, even today, uh, some of them reject Paul as an apostle. They have to because uh, so much of Paul's teachings was making that very point that uh, you, you must not have any faith in your own righteousness. You must, your faith must be 100% in Jesus, not yourself. Um, I had a following out with uh, uh, a couple of brothers uh, about a year ago when I did a verse-by-verse uh, -verse commentary on the book of Acts. And uh, when we get to chapter 15, verse 1, and it says that uh, there are men from Judea, and they said that uh, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. 
And when we were discussing that, I found out that these uh, brothers, uh, they believe that uh, uh, a person did not have to have 100% faith in Jesus. They could have faith in Jesus plus uh, faith in circumcision or water baptism or uh, speaking in tongues or, or uh, you can make a list uh, as long as you want of other things that people are uh, claiming are requirements for our salvation. Uh, but these brothers, they uh, they were they actually did a uh, I uh, use a what I call I would call a pejorative uh, to me and to anybody who agrees with me on this that they are not one of those 100 percenters. In other words, I believe the scriptures tell us that our faith must be 100 percent on Jesus, nothing else. It can't be 90 percent in Jesus and 10 percent in your own religious works. It can't even be 99% in Jesus and 1% in, well, you got water baptized. You had to get water baptized too. It has to be 100% in Jesus. So uh, I will wear this title, I'm a 100%er. I'll wear it as a badge or a crown, just like as I wear the title, Easy Believism, as a, as a, as a crown. Um, so all this to say that uh, Paul is stating right off the bat that he is an apostle. Paul, an apostle. And he says, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Uh, so he, he tells us that he, he didn't become an apostle because he was appointed like Matthias was, when they drew lots and selected Matthias to be the replacement. Uh, no, he, he's not an apostle because uh, the church in Jerusalem decreed it. He's not a, an apostle because of any church council met and voted and appointed him. He's an apostle because Jesus himself appeared to him and made him uh, an apostle and what he learned about Jesus and uh, salvation. He got directly from Jesus, not from any, uh, any man, not from any of the other apostles. Um, uh, I like to look at the Amplified translation also. I'm reading from the KJV. KJV is what I rely on as scripture, but sometimes when I look at an Amplified or some other translation, Sometimes there's some interesting insight that could be helpful. Um, but I always test all other translations against the KJV. Uh, and if there's a disagreement, uh, then uh, I'm going to rely on the KJV. Um, Paul, an apostle, not commissioned and sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ, the Messiah and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me. Um, well, it says that God the Father raised him from the dead. Um, there's, uh, there are other places where uh, the scriptures tell, tell us that um, the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. There's uh, other places where uh, the scripture says that Jesus himself would raise himself from the dead. Uh, in, in the, I think it's the first chapter of John, uh, when the Jews demand a sign from Jesus, he says, I destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. And the Jews were confused and even outraged at, at Jesus. They said, how in the world can you 
rebuild the temple in three days, they were thought he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, when they said, you can't build it in three days, it took our fathers, our ancestors, uh, 40 years to build it. And you're claiming you can rebuild it in three days? And then the scriptures say, but Jesus was not referring to the temple made with stones in Jerusalem. He was referring to the temple of his body. Uh, so uh, in that way, Jesus said that destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up again. So Jesus claimed that he would be the one who raised himself from the dead. So I always found that interesting that uh, the scriptures tell us that the father raised him from the dead, the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead, and Jesus raised himself from the dead. So I guess there was a collaboration. They all, they all contributed to this resurrection. Um, uh, verse 2 says, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, well, so here's a, um, a it's a greeting, uh, a, a salutation, a, uh, a blessing saying, grace be to you in peace. So he's praying because when you appeal to God to do something, it's a prayer. So he's saying, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, um, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Now, there, the Lordship heretics, um, they want to grab a hold of any phrase or any word that they can possibly use to um, uh, thwart the, uh, the, the free gift theology and, and uh, prop up their heresy that uh, uh, believe, believing in Jesus is not enough. More is required of you. So anytime there's a, even a word that they can use, I'd like to bring it to your attention and, and let's talk about it. It says here, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Uh, let's see how it's phrased in the Amplified. Who gave himself as a sacrifice to atone for our sins, to save and sanctify us so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. Um, the problem is the word might. Uh, the word might, uh, if we were to probably just look it up uh, in the dictionary, and the way it's normally understood is that, uh, well, he might, but he might not. It's, there's no certainty with the word might. Um, but I think if we took the time to look at many other translations, uh, we might find that the word might uh, is probably replaced with other words that are uh, uh, give us certainty. <clears throat> but so the Lordship heretic could say he might, but then, if all you do is believe in him, but you don't repent of your sins, you don't change your life, and you don't have a Pentecostal, uh, you know, uh, uh, experience of the the, uh, um, um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. If you don't, if you don't have all these other things in addition to your faith, then he might not. You, you, you're not going to be saved. So 
That's why when the word might is used, they will try to use that to put doubt in your mind. But uh, it's important for us to understand that uh, uh, the word might, uh, when we look at that and all the other verses that, that tell us that it's certain, it's absolute, there's no question he, he might or he might not. No, it's absolutely certain. So when we look at everything in there, uh, look at the Bible as a whole, look at uh, all the verses pertaining to salvation and the certainty, the blessed assurance, then we, we know that uh, the word might should not give us any, any doubts or worry that he might not. Um, now, verse 5 says, To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So this is the, basically the first five verses is like the introduction, the greeting, the uh, uh, it's kind of getting the, the formalities over with. And now at verse six, we get into, okay, here, here we begin to know the actual subject of this letter. Verse six, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Um, so when Paul says, I marvel, let me read that in the Amplified, see how they phrase it. I am astonished and extremely irritated <laughs> that you are so quickly shifting your allegiance and deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different, even contrary gospel, which is really not another gospel, but there are obviously some people masquerading as teachers who are disturbing and confusing you with a misleading counterfeit teaching and want to distort the gospel of Christ, twisting it into something which it is, it absolutely is not. Um, so that's, I think, for those of you who like to be, uh, look only at the KJV, I think if we just look at verses six and seven, we can see that in, the, in this case, uh, the Amplified does amplify and does expound and, and elaborate uh, more fully to give us a more uh, complete understanding uh, of exactly what these, these verses are saying. Yeah, it's pretty clear cut in the KJV, verse 6 and 7. There shouldn't be any confusion. But uh, um, as I said, uh, sometimes the Amplified version is... Uh, it elaborates enough that we are even, we have a better understanding. So he's, Paul's saying, I'm astonished and extremely irritated. Or in the KJV, uh, I marvel. So he's really amazed. He's shocked. He's dismayed. He's befuddled. He's surprised. He's astonished. It, it's hard for him to even imagine that they could be um, won over by these false teachers. Now, in, in Romans and, 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 and Galatians, uh, really, the, the theme really is all about the false teachers, uh, as I said, who are the thorn in the flesh of, of Paul, who are continuing to uh, follow him and after... He stab, Paul establishes a church. They go and they try, they try to spoil his work and they try to uh, ruin the gospel by adding in uh, Judaism uh, and saying, you've got to practice Judaism. You've got Here's a list of other things you've got to do in addition to believing in Jesus. So Paul, uh, he's amazed. He's shocked that they are won over by these false teachers. 
he probably just assumed that these people are rock solid. That he taught them the truth, that salvation is a free gift, and uh, and, and and now they don't believe it's a free gift. They believe you've got to do some work for it too. So he he's really uh, uh, really is amazed. I, I don't know if you can relate to that in any, any experiences you've had where you've been totally shocked and disappointed when someone, well, I can tell you that I've had several people I've known on YouTube. Now, I've been here for nine years and uh, I've had some people, so one person comes to mind who was a pastor, who was a, uh, I believe salvation is a free gift as, as uh, I do. Uh, and and uh, defended uh, the real gospel uh, as well as anybody. And shocked, I'm shocked, I'm amazed, I'm astonished, he became an atheist. Uh, I've had other people that have worked closely with me and collaborating with me on these Google Hangouts that they became atheists. Uh, so when that does happen, it is amazing, it is shocking. And it's just it's mind-boggling. So Paul says uh, in verse 8, he says, well, first let me back up here, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. In the Amplified, it says just to distort the gospel of Christ, twisting it into something which it absolutely is not. So the word gospel literally translates to good news. Uh, if I told you that uh, the, the Bible says that you, you, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to believe in Jesus, and here's a, here's a list of 20 other things that you've got to do. You, you've got to get water baptized and you've got to speak in tongues as a sign that you've really got the Holy Spirit, uh, and you've got to repent of, uh, on, uh, for your sins, and not only that, you better shed tears. There must be real contrition. You must have a broken heart and shed real tears, uh, and then you've got to totally change your life, and you better never even sin again one time. If you do, it proves that you never really got saved. Uh, and, and let's say, I, there's more things on this, but that's just part of them. If I told you that, and, and then said, isn't that good news? <laughs> you, you'd say, good news? You're, 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 you're putting a, a, a burden on, on me that is so difficult that it's impossible. How in the world can I do that? How I have to completely stop sinning for my whole life. I have to even never even have a, a bad thought. Uh, it's impossible. Well, that's what Jesus said about the rich young ruler uh, when he he left all dejected. And the apostles said, "Well." based on what you've been saying to us, Lord, that if your eye causes you to sin, you better pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, you better cut it off. You need to go and be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You need to go and sin no more. And, and the rich young ruler, he's got to sell everything he owns to give it to the poor and come and follow us in poverty. Uh, uh, Lord, if this is the case, how is it possible for anyone to get saved? And Jesus says, basically, hallelujah, you get it now. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So the, 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 the point is that uh, I... Jesus, I like to call them the impossible sayings of Jesus, and some of them I've mentioned. Um, but these things should not be understood that Jesus is telling us 
This is the means of salvation. Do all these things. Here's a list of things you got to do, and, and you better do it all perfectly uh, if you want to go to heaven. No, he's he's using that as Paul used uh, the, the the law as a schoolmaster to teach people that hey, this is impossible, Lord. How is it possible for anyone to be saved? Well, now that you understand that, now you know you need me. Because with God, it is it is possible. Only with God. And Jesus is our Savior God. Uh, so, um, all this, let me see, where was I? Uh, so, perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, that's what uh, that's what these uh, Judaizers were doing. Uh, that's what the legalists throughout history, almost all of Christendom, and, uh, are uh, legalists. Uh, almost all of uh, Christendom believe that uh, there's a list of requirements you've got to do in addition to believing in Jesus. They don't necessarily agree of on all the points of, on the list, but they they almost universally agree that faith alone in Christ alone is not enough. Uh, so that's the state of Christendom. But uh, Christianity is the little group of people who understand uh, what is said here. That that's another gospel. It's a false gospel, and it can't save anybody. That uh, only the real gospel. It's the only when I say gospel, it's only good news if you understand that, wow, you mean I, there's no way I could work my way to heaven because I, I would always fall short. But God loves me so much that he'll give me eternal life and heaven as a free gift just because of what Jesus did for me. And if I'll just believe in him and rely on him, completely. I get it as a free gift. Hallelujah. That is good news. That is gospel good news. I call it the shocking good news because almost everybody I've ever talked to about this, uh, they're unfamiliar with the gospel. They're unfamiliar with free gift theology. And when they understand it, and learn that, wait, you mean the Bible doesn't say we have to work our way to heaven by being religious, but the Bible says we go to heaven as a free gift because we've trusted Jesus completely? Then they, they can jump for joy. They can celebrate because it truly is good news. But it's shocking good news because it's so foreign to almost everybody in the world. Um, so, but he says, he says in verse 8, but though we, which is Paul and his companions, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So, Paul is saying, but though we, that, that includes Paul saying, if I tell you something different, or if any of my companions and my co-workers here, uh, or in any apostles, anybody, even if an angel from heaven appears to you with a contrary message, then they are to be accursed. They are cursed and their message is cursed. Um, now, the interesting thing I find about this, just looking at history, um, around um, in the 6th century AD, uh, there's a famous person named Muhammad and the claim is that an angel from heaven appeared to him and taught him. And uh, what, he, what he taught him would 
that's what makes up the, the writings in the Quran. And Muhammad says this particular angel was Gabriel. Uh, so here's an example. Paul warned that even if an angel appears to you with a contrary message that than the one that he told them, that salvation is a free gift, no strings attached, nothing else required, it's completely free, uh, then they are to be cursed. But um, here we have over a, a billion people who believe this lie. Now, did, did Muhammad make up the whole thing? Maybe. Did an angel actually appear to him? Which I would have to say would be a, a demonic angel, a fallen angel, uh, not certainly not Gabriel. Uh, but if, if an angel or some kind of spirit being did appear to Muhammad and taught him this uh, false message that we find in Islam and the Quran, then this is an example of what Paul warned about. And now we also have uh, in, the, in the 19th century here in America, we have someone named Joseph Smith who said another exactly uh, the same kind of a claim as Muhammad. And he said that uh, an angel appeared to him, and this particular angel's name was Moroni, M-O-R-O-N-I. M-O-R-O-N spells moron. So this, this angel that um, um, either appeared to Joseph Smith or perhaps Joseph Smith absolutely fabricated the whole thing and it's nothing but fiction and lies. Either way, uh, Paul warned about it. And so in both of these examples, we have uh, another religion springing up basing basically on the based on the premise that what we get in the Bible is uh, not true that the Bible has been corrupted you can't trust it and uh, the truth is that uh, what the Quran says and the Book of Mormon says that's the truth and, and that uh, there are uh, uh, and both of those religions are based uh, exactly on what we find here in Galatians. The Judaizers, the, uh, the false teachers who are saying faith in Jesus is not enough. Religion is also required. Whether it's Judaism or Mormonism or Islam, they add religion to it. And uh, so these are two historic examples of uh, um, there's millions and even billions of people who have fallen for the lie that Paul has warned them against. He says, if we or even an angel from heaven appears with you with a contrary gospel, then it's to be accursed. Let me read that uh, in uh, verse 8 in the Amplified. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we originally preached to you, let him be condemned to destruction. All right, now let's go to verse uh, uh, 9. As we said before, so he just stated this, and immediately he's going to repeat the same thing again. And when something is repeated like that, that's to drive the point home, hammering it home, to emphasize it. I'm so serious. You better take this seriously. This is a life and death issue I'm telling you about right now. But the life it is eternal life. Will you have it or not? The death issue is the second death. The 
destruction of both body and soul in the lake of fire. So Paul is emphasizing this so that we know, take this as dead serious. It's that important. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preached any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed, accursed. So, let me see. I, mean, I don't want to go on too long here. So, verse 10 says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of God, of Christ. This kind of also reminds me of the apostle Peter when uh, James and the Jerusalem church were outraged because Peter entered the home of a Gentile. Not only that, he dined with them. Not only that, it was Gentile food, not kosher food. Not only that, he told them about Jesus and Jesus and, and uh, you know, this Messiah. He's supposed to only be for the Jews, not for Gentiles. But Peter stood his ground against James and the Jerusalem church, saying the basically the same thing here. I, I'd rather argue against men and disagree with you than disagreeing and trying to argue against God. God told Peter to go to Cornelius' house. God told him that nothing is unclean and whether it's the, 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 the dietary laws, forget that. That no longer applies. That's what God told Peter. The dietary laws no longer apply. And as far as being unclean, that, that even applies to Gentiles. Don't think that Gentiles are unclean and you have to be separate from them. So Steve, Peter and now Paul here both took a stand uh, against men in favor of honoring and respecting and obeying what God wanted them to do. Um, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And in the Amplified, it says it this way. Am I now trying to win the favor and approval of men or of God? Or am I seeking to please someone? If I were to still, if I were still trying to be popular with men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. Um, okay, so verse 10 is where I'm going to end this uh, video for today. But I also want to relate this point to, uh, it's the same kind of conclusion that I reached probably about seven years ago, seven or eight years ago. <clears throat> I had been on YouTube for a year or two, and I... I tried to uh, focus entirely on uh, the gospel and evangelism. If you look at my earliest videos, um, the first couple of years, um, I didn't have any Q&A videos where people could ask me questions about any theological subject. <clears throat> now, I stuck strictly to the gospel and uh, evangelism. Uh, I didn't do any teaching videos on uh, all these various subjects. I have uh, over 50 playlists now, and uh, many of those playlists are, are topical and uh, a, a really wide range of theological topics uh, that, are, that are of great interest and uh, some of them of great importance some of them of lesser importance, but uh, in the beginning, 
I focused like a laser beam on the gospel and evangelism. And I did that for two reasons. One, because that's the most important thing. And, and, and two, uh, because I didn't want to enter the uh, arena of controversy uh, about uh, hell uh, or end times and eschatology, you know, millennium, tribulation, pre, mid, post tribulation raptures, uh, Bible translations, uh, uh, all these all these subjects that I have later decided that I want to talk about. I want to express my opinion on it. I want to have an open discussion about these things. Uh, yes, uh, I have taught and and uh, uh, listened to uh, varying opinions on all these things. And I've formulated my opinions, my conclusions. Some of these, I, um, some of my conclusions I'm quite confident. Uh, I doubt that I'll be persuaded to move away because I've already considered all the various viewpoints and, um, and uh, given a, a fair hearing uh, and feel confident in my conclusion. And then there's other topics where I'm not so confident. Uh, I've studied it. I've studied eschatology from every point of view you can imagine. Uh, futurism, historicism, idealism, preterism, all these different things. The, the best experts from every one of these camps, I've listened to them, and, and I've gone through the book of Revelation verse by verse with a half dozen of the different experts. And yet... I have an opinion, but I'm not so confident. I, I would not attempt to teach it with certainty that I'm sure I'm right on this. No. But the point I'm getting at is that the first year or two, I didn't even dare to uh, stray away from the gospel and evangelism. And because I didn't want the controversy, I didn't want to do something that would possibly have any divisions. Uh, because what's really important are the core doctrines, the essentials of Christianity. That is the deity of Christ. Salvation is a free gift by faith alone in Christ alone. No works are required on our part to get saved, to keep our salvation, or to prove that we're truly saved. And that once we put our faith in Jesus, it's irrevocable by God or by us. We can never lose our salvation for any reason. These are the core doctrines of Christianity, and uh, that's what uh, is really important. But when you go off into other subjects, um, and there's a lot of interesting subjects, uh, then these subjects are of lesser importance. Yeah, I'd like to... I'd like to be able to be right about everything in the Bible, but I'm not omniscient. I, I am fallible. So I'm not confident that I'm right about everything. But we don't have to be right about everything, but we better be right about the essentials because they are essential. Um, but all this being said to make the point that um, I was careful to not get sidetracked on other theological subjects. Um, but I also reached a point where uh, some of my closest friends on YouTube were early years. Uh, uh, they are what was commonly referred to as hyper dispensationalists. Um, I like the term Paul onlyists. And the problem was that even though we agreed that salvation is a free gift and we can't lose it, and yeah, we agreed on these essentials, uh, but they thought that, uh, wait a second, Luke, you're, you just quoted a verse from John. And you can't, you can't use John uh, when you're talking about salvation because John is not to us. That's to, that's to the Jews, and uh, that's uh, 
That's a, you, you, you can't, can only be saved by listening to Paul. Paul is our apostle. And that, uh, not only that, uh, the book of Romans through Philemon, that's the only thing that matters to us for our salvation. And then even more specifically, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, or 3 and 4, uh, for, they don't necessarily always agree on how many verses are needed. I, I would say that if you're going to say that that portion of verses are, are required to believe and understand and, and in order to get saved, then you better go all the way through verse 8 because the whole thought goes through verse 8. It doesn't stop at verse 4. But the point is that these hyper-dispensations, these paul only uh, I finally decided I need to speak my mind on this. I, 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 I was afraid of losing friends, afraid of losing popularity. And some of these people were, they were my closest friends on YouTube. But I knew that if I spoke out against paul only that uh, there would be consequences. But as it says here, verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. In the Amplified, it says, am I now trying to win the favor and approval of men or of God? Or am I seeking to please someone? If I were still trying to be popular with men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. That was the position I found myself in, and, and I decided that I need to tell the Paul Olius that they're wrong. I can't remain silent. And once I did, then probably about 10 or 20 of my best friends on YouTube all left, and, and uh, we haven't had any relationship for all these years because I dared to speak out against Paulonism and I dared to say that a person can be saved by reading the Gospel of John that they didn't they, they, they didn't have to stick strictly with Paul's words and so uh, but once I did that it was liberating because I felt I'm I'm going to be on the side of truth, what I think is the truth. I want I don't want to be in bondage to popularity. Uh, truth trumps popularity. Uh, whether it's the subject is hell or or end times or any any other subject. I I, I want to be free to say what I really think. If you disagree good. Maybe I'm wrong. I want to hear, tell me how I'm wrong. I'll consider it. And uh, you might persuade me I'm wrong. If you persuade me I'm wrong, I won't be a stubborn fool holding on to an error once it's been proven wrong. No, I'll change my mind. And uh, some of the positions I hold now are a result of that very process. People said I'm wrong. I listened to them. I studied their point of view and they won me over to that side. Uh, so, uh, Paul here, and then Peter in Acts, and in my own experience, we, we decided that, no, I have, to, I have to listen to my own conscience or, my, or the Holy Spirit or the scriptures. I have, to, I have to be faithful to that rather than, you know, towing the line to, to be popular within a particular group of people in a community here on YouTube. All right. So uh, getting through this book of Galatians is going to take some time. This was uh, just 10 verses. Um, so I look forward to your, uh, your, your comments and your thoughts. Thank you for watching and uh, share the videos. Bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.